So, as I draw along, I will keep talking, as I explained in my previous video. Now, how to build up a color pencil drawing? Again, first with very fine, thin, establishing lines, probably in graphite pencil, and then expand into color hues once the basic shape has been defined, delineated, always starting out with the silhouette of the entire object, subsequently correcting the outline, honing in on the ideal, clear, imagined, yet physically non-existent borderlines of the subject of your observation, long before you start any shading. Keep thinking. Which lines do define the object? What can you afford to omit? What do you need to emphasize? Only then, when the foundation for a convincing representation has been laid out, will I start shading. In color, as soon as possible, to include the hue information and establish different planes that meet at different angles. Do use the best artist's materials that you can afford. Quality pigments will make a difference. Not only out of paint tubes, but also in pencil leads. This is important for longevity, but also for the vibrance of your colors. In digital photography, we would call this expanding the dynamic range. And the softness of quality pigments is important for the flow of the pencil tip on the paper. Acid-free paper, if you deem the drawing subject interesting enough to survive some centuries. But for me, any paper or pencil will do, as I do practice my skills for my own enjoyment. Shading happens in directional lines. Even finer and decisive lines do delineate the border of an object. One bold stroke or demarcation line says more than hundreds of shading marks, especially when dealing with soft drawing media that allow for smudging. Blurriness, softness, out-of-focus techniques and materials we will deal with later. But for now, we stick to the mere observational that finds its expression in the most simple lines. Outlines have been established, and their directionality also conveys volume. Now we are fleshing out the skeletonized draft. But keep your concentration, your focus, as if you are still outlining with a few brief strokes. Be bold with demarcation lines. Build up volume with cross-hatching. Every single mark being added needs to convey valuable information, necessary to enable the observer to decipher the drawing. After all, we are dealing with an irregular shape, a single red bell pepper. It is important to establish its form in space. We need to decide what we present as front and how we do differentiate the sides. And each side is warped with countable convexities and concavities. Do we choose to truly recreate each one of them on paper? We are striving to reproduce a visual analog, almost like a monocular camera obscura, an impossible challenge under stereoscopic vision. And we keep working round, bringing to life all those elements that conjure up the illusion of an object in space. I guess I am talking volume here. But equally important are the color hues, the yellows, oranges and reds that will define the surface area of this common vegetable. Painting the bell pepper would probably be easier, but we will get to that in other videos. For now, the cross-hatching can follow the surface curvature, but it does not have to. There are a few different ways of building up a pencil drawing. Will we cover the pepper's entire expanse with pigments, like in a painting? Or shall we stay in the realm of drawing with broken lines and mere hints of dimensionality? 
Do slow down. To observe whenever necessary. Don't be in a rush. Give yourself time. Drawing and painting will develop good skills in you. Observation, contemplation, reflection, patience, appreciation. Once you start the process, the practice of drawing and painting will guide you along. No longer will you be overlooking things. You will discover color variations in areas that previously were all unicolor to your eye. You will get into the habit of measuring proportions at a glance, constantly hovering in, optically, with your naked eye to refine previous measurements. You will pick up the center of gravity of any object in a thrice. You will comprehend the distinct attributes of any shape without hesitation. You will relate all proportions of any form to its midpoint, to its center in an imaginary two-dimensional plane, a Cartesian grid. You will be able to reduce any object in nature to a mere outline, an abstraction, right in the middle of your practice of realism, since objects in the field of vision do not have borderlines. They simply do end where their background begins. You rise to play the trick on you of focusing on both those planes alternately, so you do experience a virtually endless depth of field. They also will trick you to misapprehend robustness of perspective at the periphery of your visual matrix. I love it when my brain does replicate the distortions that naturally do occur at the edges of peripheral vision while I am drawing away, whereby abandoning realism for naturalism becomes a necessity, not an option, ultimately. But I am jumping ahead of myself. You will get more intimate with the paper you are drawing upon and with your drawing materials. It is a sensory experience of touch, too, not just a visual encounter. Your hands will learn to feel their way around and across the vast emptiness of the blank sheet. Whites come in a variety of shades, ranging from the most supportive cream hues to the most daunting snow white. Daunting to draw on, as you are up against the brightness that will expose any error that you might make. Sometimes you will need to draw out of your wrist, sometimes out of your elbow, other times out of your shoulder and, occasionally, even your hip. Riffling through your papers will take on a different meaning altogether once you start holding them. Just like in painting, building up layers over layers over layers of pigments, approximating the final look, a realistic color hue and value as you work around, building up all areas alternately, almost simultaneously. Any new set of strokes added will shift the color balance and dynamic range of all other marks on the paper. Yet, we do aim to get it right on the first attempt, although that rarely happens, especially in a drawing technique that needs to spare out blank areas to represent the highlights of the object it depicts, preserving the untouched surface of the paper all the way through the drawing process, resulting in little islands of white in a sea of inundating color modulation. Shifting tides any moment the pencil adds another coat of paint. Sometimes slowing down to elaborate a detail. At other times speeding up with controlled gestural marks. Keep working it. Density of pigment application will define different surface qualities. Strokes are directional and need to further define the volume. Just chisel it in. You are defining the point of maximum saturation. Just like the spared out blank spots will yield the maximum whiteness. 
pretty much like establishing pedestal and gain in color correction of video footage. Mixing hues with dry pigments of a color pencil lead is not the same as dissolving them in water or oil. Blending only does occur through overlay and optical illusion in the eyes of the observer. Cross-hatching of red and orange hues to build up the pepper skin. Blue, green, yellow and even grey strokes will combine to represent the stem of the vegetable facing us. More work needs to be done. Line versus plane. Leaving outline behind, we need to establish volume through planes that meet at different angles. This would be more conspicuous in the sketch of a sculptor. Yet, a painter too does not need to be limited to color planes, but is free to design with directionality of pencil or brush stroke alone. Do keep observing. We are not just filling in the areas defined by the silhouette fixed onto the paper earlier on. Any flat expanse in two dimensions needs to represent curvature of spatial volume in three dimensions in front of us. Unlike in music, which is the fine art of repetition, in visual arts we are not just reinterpreting what is set in stone for us by the composer. Every mark we add to the sketch is by design, follows mere observation or pure imagination. Of course, it is an interpretation too, but of an object or subject that we may discover for the first time ever. The final outcome is not prescribed by notes scribbled on a sheet of music. And music or sound by its very nature is abstract and free of any restriction to bear a resemblance to the world it is referencing or representing. Be it a thunderstorm, a sunset, the rage of war, or internalized emotions ranging from love to hate and all shades of grey in between. Think how music does describe tears. By contrast, in drawing and painting, we do strive to give a visual analogue. Mark by mark and stroke by stroke adding a signifier that bears resemblance to the merely described or the purely remembered. It is tedious work. Well, nothing of importance comes easy in this world. At least not in art. But it is fun. Especially when the lines and planes on paper do come alive and begin telling a story that goes beyond the replicated and visualized. Just how much red is in the skin of a red bell pepper? Let us include orange and yellow hues to arrive at a more colorful modulation. Keep it visually interesting. Do lead the beholder's eye through the drawing. Draw the observer in. Is that... Why we call it drawing? Not because we do pull pencil or crayon over the paper. Pigment bearing leads encapsulated in wooden shell being dragged across a blank surface while registering scratchy pencil marks. The particular challenge of a color pencil drawing is the mixing of hues right on the paper. It is tantamount to using paints squeezed straight out of the tube. Watercolor, acrylic and oil paints. We do pre-mix on the painter's palette. By contrast, pigments straight off the color pencil lead need to optically mix in overlapping cross-hatching patterns or layers of pigment dust. No glazing possible. Let us stick to the mere color pencils here and ignore the hybrid form of water dilutable pencils. I do use both types interchangeably in dry mode, but in this video I do not further dilute them. Primary colors. 
and a few secondary hues on the color wheel. Unfortunately, I do own only a handful of color pencils. It would be nice to have the entire set, but it isn't necessary. As long as we do accept a limited dynamic range. You can only recreate so much with a particular choice of color hues on your palette. Here I do need to preserve the silver light reflection on the right side of the red bell pepper, building up the illusion of depth and volume in space, and all enacted in a hard medium. Even the softest pencil touch needs to be strong enough to leave a mark on the paper. And this one is rather smooth and not so grainy. Surface quality of the sheet of paper does determine outcome. Varying degrees of pencil pressure do yield the tonal range, the maximum gradient of values achievable with a single drawing tool. Optically mixing color by use of pencils of different shades almost does go beyond a finite number of hue combinations. High time to add a hint of a cast shadow here. Starting out with blue, as blue is found in any shadow. Soon adding dark red and gray. Just keep observing. Stick to the color information in nature right in front of you. For this type of drawing, an observational drawing, constantly keep intensifying pencil pressure to mold the shape of the object in an illusory space. Working around the entire drawing, approximating the final look with every new layer being added. How do you make a drawing interesting, initially, or, more importantly, at this stage, how do you keep it interesting? Well, by adding only well-observed elements. Keep chiseling them in. Did we establish a maximum dynamic range of values? Did we spare out the white highlights and replicate the darkest tones? Did we achieve a good ratio between discernible detail and an overall synthesis? Narrow your eyes. Almost close them. What do you see? That way it is possible to perceive the overall shape while reducing unwanted detail that we failed to omit. How much of a resemblance did we achieve? Is the result visually pleasing? Is it even more interesting to behold than the original object, the model in nature? Remember, it is an artistic interpretation, even in case of strict adherence to realism. The human eye simply does perceive and process visual information differently than any camera sensor. Our perceptual apparatus is far more active. It plays tricks on us, placing emphasis on some aspects while neglecting others. A highly selective instrument to work with. Much love and peace. Namaste.